afternoon. Thank you guys so much for joining us. This is our fourth and final NDSU Extension Horse Management webinar series. Uh, we're just so glad you guys joined us for all four of them. Of course, you're getting the um, email and they're all on the playlist of, of on YouTube. And so you can watch them at any time, the previous ones we've done, and this one will be emailed out as well. So today we're gonna be talking about arena and facility footing. And again, my co-hosts um, get to be our presenters today. And so my name is Mary Kina. I'm the Livestock Environmental Management Specialist with NDSU Extension. And my co-hosts and presenters today are Rachel Wald from McHenry County and Paige Brumman from Ward County. So they are the Ag and Natural Resource Extension agents in those counties. Um, and they're also my horse team. So with that, we're gonna start with Rachel today and then we'll move on to Paige and we'll have some questions at the end. Hi everyone, uh, like Mary, Mary said, my name is Rachel Wald. I am with NDSU Extension in McHenry County. Um, and I just wanted to bring up, so this is the kind of the first page. I, what I'm going to talk about is basically outside of the arena or outside of the barn and the stable. Um, you know, what we need to plan for for managing. Everyone sees mud every year, especially this year. Um, where, like Mary's talked about before, where that manure needs to go. Um, how to manage snow as well, um, talking about rain and, and where all that goes, talking about a drainage system, and then also about erosion, because that's going to be a huge deal when it comes to those high traffic areas that we're going to talk about, uh, where your horses go, where your tractors go, where you're feeding, all of that. So some benefits of managing some of these high traffic areas um, definitely include the health of a horse. You're going to be making sure that that their foot health is is optimal. You don't want those those areas really wet so that foot um, can really wick up a lot of those things. You want to make sure that their feet and legs are doing well, and that's going to go into the health of the horse. And then also talking about different things, including their respiratory system and horse's mental health as well. We're going to stop some of that breeding ground or talk about, you know, reducing some of the breeding ground for insects in some of these areas. We definitely want to reduce injuries because anywhere there's water, um, sometimes you can get into some, some injuries with thrush or disease, but also water turns to ice in the wintertime and that could mean injuries um, for that horse on accident as well. A lot of the times if your horse is standing in water or in heavy areas with snow, they get chilled pretty easily um, in those moist conditions. So we want to make sure that that we're creating a spot for them to keep them warm and healthy. With this, it's going to increase some of those farm efficiencies to make sure you can get that tractor in and out, to make sure you can do your chores on time. Um, and then also when you bring that horse in to take care of it, it's going to take a lot less time. Managing runoff, it's something that Mary's talked talked on or touched on a lot, um, especially when it comes to uh, manure management. And it, this, this plays into it as well. Uh, we want to manage that runoff. And then we want to ensure water quality. And water quality means that um, any of that runoff or any of that nutrients isn't going into an open stream or, or surface water that may end up going downstream causing issues, um, or even a pond on your facility, uh, making sure that that runoff does not does not cause any issues with water quality in that pond uh, because blue-green algae can become an issue as well, uh, which is toxic to, to all plants, or sorry, to all animal life. So we wanna make sure that that is something that we address as well. Some preventative measures. If you guys are lucky enough to start out um, with a fresh slate, that facility layout is gonna be key. Um, you want to make sure that all of your key places, your arena, your barn, any loafing spaces where you feed, uh, where there's water, needs to be elevated or, or on a hill or high up um, so that, that the chances of any runoff or any puddling or any erosion um, may not take place. So we're going to talk about some of the preventative measures that we can do uh, to, to minimize the possibility of those things. But other areas we want to watch out for, I know right outside that barn, when you when you take a step outside that door, a lot of the times you end up in a puddle. 
So those are one of, one of the places right outside an indoor arena um, around those bale feeders, like I talked about, gates are another big one, waters. Um, those, so those loafing areas that might be in dry lots are where they hang out the most. The other place that I wanna mention is tie areas, areas that you might tie. Um, so if you're like me, I have a young horse, um, she likes to dig holes. And sometimes we need to watch um, those tie out areas to make sure that that um, is also maintained. And then your trailer parking, because nobody wants to go through a whole bunch of water to get to their trailer. So some of the reasons that we have these issues, uh, especially with tractors, when we're moving in and out at that gate, there's a high level of compaction that may cause an inability for that water to infiltrate into the ground. So those poor spaces, um, soil or, or ground are supposed to act kind of like a sponge. And they're supposed to have a little bit of space in it so that so that water can infiltrate through. And that's how, how our plants pick up the water as they go down to the root system. So that um, compaction that might happen at the gate or you know, just outside your barn or just outside your arena or around where you bale feed or around that water, compaction becomes an issue. Um, so, those, so those are some things that we wanna watch for. In wet years, um, if you have high water tables, this goes back to another thing that Mary mentioned, you know, watch what your, what your pastures are doing or where your water is going when it rains or when kind of some issue areas. And that talks about draining. So draining into those key areas as well, knowing what, what areas you're gonna have issues with. The other issue might be, you know, if you haven't cleaned out in a while, a lot of organic matter that can really hold a lot of water. So um, some of the manure, some of the old bales, if you put out um, wood chips or straw, those can also hold a lot of moisture as well. So cleaning all those areas out, um, making sure that you put it into your compost pile or, or your refuse pile. And then where should or could this water go? Um, we need to think about making a plan on our operations as to where we can if we, if we can get a drainage system, where should or could this water go to make sure that uh, we're not getting any runoff that's going to cause any issues, um, any water concerns or health concerns for your animals um, or your neighbors? You don't want to, you know, be draining it into wherever your neighbors are either. So we can start kind of talking about how we can mitigate some of the, the issues that we might have with moisture. Um, and downspouts over arena walk doors or over your barn door or over a loafing shed can definitely divert some of that excess rain away um, so that it helps with, with the amount of moisture that maybe is in that area. It's one of those kind of cheap, easy things that we can add to uh, an existing structure and hopefully divert it away to a vegetative area. So what we're looking for is, is a good area that maybe the horses don't go, that you can water that lawn just a little bit more. So another option is you can set up a high, high use pad uh, with drainage. So that's, that's another option. If you've ever heard of a French drain or a dry well drain, um, that might be something that's underneath a high use pad. Um, that can move that water out of the way, keeping that high use area high and dry. The other option is changing footing in that high traffic area. We want to be careful with this because sometimes just adding footing, just like adding gravel, isn't going to cover what we need. So adding gravel might, might work for a little bit of time and it might make it look nice for a short period of time, but you're likely going to have to add more later. So we wanna make sure if you don't wanna to continue to do that, um, to do it correctly the first time. And we're gonna kind of mention some options for that here in just a minute. The other thing is cleaning those areas often. We wanna have a compost pile away from that area, but we also want it close enough that we don't really have to trek. We don't wanna make it a chore for you, right? We wanna be able to make it something that you can easily do every day or every other day to make sure that those areas are cleaned up and good to go. So when we talk about dry lots or sacrifice areas or even exercise paddocks, um, the goal with these areas is to kind of have a small part of your grazing system 
where any your horses can go so that they can have access to a dry ground. Also, they're going to have feed, a safe area to hang out, water availability. Um, and this, this land resource um, is to ensure the majority of your land has a rest that it needs to stay healthy and productive. So we definitely want to keep those pastures in good condition. And this is whether it's drought or a rainy season um, to keep them in that good, healthy, productive stage. So some reasons to manage that sacrifice lot. Um, good pasture man management keeps um, the pasture healthy and thriving. By not overgrazing, we just want to kind of mow down and control those weeds. We also want to keep horses off that wet, wet pasture because hooves will damage um, the pasture. If you've ever heard of pugging, it's actually a technical term where the horse's foot creates kind of that round shape um, and it's, it's divoted all over the place. Um, so we don't want those pasture paddocks pugged by your horses. Drought is another aspect to manage. Um, we just went through, North Dakota just went through kind of a drought cycle, uh, 17 and 21. So we have seen a couple of those instances where we wanted to manage our pastures to ensure that we would be able to see them in the coming seasons. And that means keeping your horses off of them. Those dry lots or sacrifice lots, that's what we use them for is to maintain those good pastures, keep them off wet and droughty ground. Making sure that maintenance or removal of manure or waste, kind of like I mentioned before, is always important. It'll decrease the amount of insects that are around. Um, it'll make it nice. And then it'll help with disease issues of the foot. So we definitely want to keep that in a good orderly manner. So some tips for those high traffic areas, kind of like I'd mentioned before, um, the alternative ground, it's better to get something in there for that alternative ground. Uh, ideally, we would like to see it um, maybe excavated down. Uh, so the alternate footing is, is the better, but the best would be those high traffic pads. And when we do those high traffic pads, we excavate down, um, put in a drain, put in, uh, make sure there's a nice level so that it, it's able to drain away from the area. And then you're gonna put rock over top, compacted down with new footing. That new footing then, uh, we recommend putting a, a base around so that it's a lot harder for it to erode away and easier for it to just drain down into that drain and head out the other options. When we're talking drains, we want to make sure that those drains are heading into a vegetative buffer. Those vegetative buffers help to um, filtrate all that dirty water that's coming out of your paddock. So some of the options that we can do, we could do a uh, plant trees or water loving shrubs that might enjoy getting a little extra rain um, and and filtering out those those manure particles for us or even water loving grass or all three. So those are some great options. Um, and it's going to take a little bit unless you've been there for ages and you know exactly where your water is going to go. You need to kind of monitor and see how it goes so that you can build these nice sites in. You also wanna make sure these vegetative buffers are fenced off from your horses to make sure that none of the nutrients um, that maybe are being filtered through there are gonna become an issue for you if they're standing water. And then you wanna make sure that you choose plants or trees and shrubs that aren't toxic to horses. So if something happens and they get in there, you wanna make sure that it's safe for them too. So here's a couple of resources that I found. Um, Penn State, University of Kentucky, and University of Minnesota had some great stuff on high traffic areas. I do want to talk to you guys about um, if you are looking at a high traffic pad, you may need to look into any of the, the areas around you that might need a little extra okay before you do that um, because you're moving maybe moving a lot of water. So look into your, your regula regulations in your area. But the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it along to Paige. And so as that's being passed over, um, like Rachel said, so a good place to start uh, in North Dakota would be the Department of Environmental Quality. 
um, and they might send you then to to the water commission, um, depending on how much I'm water you're going to be moving around. And, and so, so um, that is a good place if you're in another state, whatever your regulatory department is, would be able to pass you on then to whoever you would need to talk to about water. Okay, so I'm going to start talking about horse arena footing specifically. So what we're going to cover is what is considered good footing primarily in North Dakota, what would be considered poor footing or less desirable for our arenas. And then I want you to know that there is some research out there that exists on this. A lot of the research is based on racetrack footing or types of footing that maybe aren't as common in North Dakota, but it's certainly applicable and certainly could be applied. But primarily today, we're going to talk about the common options that the majority of people in North Dakota have access to and are utilizing. So the first thing I want to point out is before we get into the footing discussion, we do have to talk about location because the best footing investment placed in the wrong spot is not going to be the best footing for you. So you want to consider when you're looking at an, an arena, and this could be indoor or outdoor arena, is the slope of the land, how much excavation is going to need to be uh, required in order to build your arena. That's going to significantly increase your cost if you're going to have to dig into a hillside, remove a lot of rocks, um, tree removal, those sorts of things that go into it. Is there a place where um, maybe you want your arena in full sun so it dries quicker, or maybe you want it in partial shade so you have the option on, on warm summer days to have some shade? Is there an area where there's more wind or like in a wind tunnel spot would not be a good area to put your arena versus somewhere where maybe you have some natural wind protection that would make it more comfortable to ride, um, especially in North Dakota with our strong winds that we have uh, primarily or, or most of the part of the year. The other thing to consider is the soil type. So what type of soil is in your area? Is it heavily clayed, mostly sand, a combination of the both would be considered like a loam type. So we will talk a little bit about different soil types. Um, we get a lot of questions about size and size is really the area that you have to work with and is also event specific. So there really is no perfect size, but I will tell you that most standard arenas for certain competitions are typically 100 by 200 or more ideally 150 by 300 you can do most events in. And I also mentioned that you can always make your riding arena space smaller, but it's a little trickier to make it bigger. So um, the recommendation would be go to as big as you're able to go to within reason. But again, there's no right or wrong answer. It really depends on what your use is. And then lastly, for location, think about access for equipment to get in there and build things. And then also for maintenance of that arena space. And then also access to the horses. You can build the best arena um, on your property. But if it's you know a mile away from where you keep your horses, you maybe aren't going to utilize it as much as, as if it was a little bit closer. On the same side, you don't maybe want it right next to your house or right next to um, another barn or something like that on your place because of the, the dust and the drainage that will need needed around the area. So a lot of things to think about in location and there's no perfect answer. You just have to be thinking about in your head where you want it to go and what you have to work with. All right, so an ideal arena surface probably doesn't exist. But if it did, here are some of the things to consider. So an ideal surface is going to provide adequate cushion, traction, and drainage. So it's going to be a material that will cushion your horse's hooves. It will hold up to their, their turns and their athletic maneuvers without slippage and will drain quickly and, and dry out adequately without becoming too dry and dusty. Uh, we want our footing to be compaction resistant. Most footing over time is going to compact and we'll talk about why that is. We'd like it to be non-abrasive to hooves or minimally abrasive to the horse's hooves, not slippery when it's wet, require minimal maintenance of course, and then be not cost prohibitive. The most expensive part of um, building an arena often, or not maybe building so much as hauling in the footing, is the transportation of that, that footing. So the footing itself that you select might be fairly affordable or you know really within your budget. But when you factor in the transportation, if you have to haul it in from you know miles and miles or hundreds of miles or hours away, that's not going to be um, cost effective versus if it's a few miles down the road. 
So that's the ideal arena surface. Again, probably doesn't exist. You just try to check as many boxes as you can. That works for your situation. The surface challenges that we end up and depending upon what type of footing we have and where we located and how it's built are the following. So we can get footing that is too hard and compacted. That's going to cause more concussion on our horses, uh, particularly their, their joints. Um, however, if your footing is too soft or too deep, that's where you end up with issues on their soft tissues. So some tendon strains and injuries that way. And we'll talk about how footing can get too soft or the wrong type there. If it's too dry, it's dusty, can be hard on horses with respiratory issues or even healthy horses that that dust over time can cause some problems. If it's too wet, it's going to be slippery or unusable. Um, uneven ground is going to cause some concerns for, for slippage and injury as well. In North Dakota, we have to worry about frozen footing. Um, a majority of the year. So what can we do to keep that footing from freezing or to keep it usable as many months as possible? Um, if it's too wet, it's slippery. And then lastly, we end up with uh, debris or it can be debris. So whether that's rocks coming up from the base, maybe it's tree roots because we put our arena too close to our shelter belt or a tree row, or maybe you're on an old farmstead and you're always finding what I call treasures, things uh, that are coming up from, from you know, previous things that were in the area. So uh, that debris can cause some challenges as well. Your particular selection is going to be unique to you, and it's going to depend on the timeline that you have to build, both build the arena, but also how long or how permanent do you want it to be there? Is this something that you just need, you need to ride now, this summer? Maybe you're in a space where you don't plan to be there forever, so you just need something that will work for that property at that time. Uh, maybe they'll be quick and uh, less permanent. Uh, what's your budget? You can really start with where you're at and what you have and do the best you can with what you have to make it work for you, or you can get extremely elaborate. It also depends on the event that you're choosing to do. Are you building an arena just for a safe footing for general riding and training, or are you event specific? So if you're doing speed events, we have some different considerations. If you're doing an event that requires a sliding stop, like raining or cow horse, or maybe some, um, some deep stops like cutting or some really quick turns and maneuvers, you're, every event is gonna have different requirements and preferences. If you hang around a specific event long enough, certainly you'll find a horse owner that'll say the footing isn't right or the footing isn't ideal for what they want to use it for. Again, what you select is going to depend on your primary use footing or um, pounding the ground. That'll also depend on um, your selection of footing. So over on the right hand side, we kind of break it into three categories. So I say good is using what you have till the ground that you're that you're on and you're given and, and ride your horse. And for some people, that is the option and that they need to do. A better option would be if you have the ability to remove that topsoil, compact and grade the sub base and the base. And we'll talk about that a bit and then blend your surface material for your primary use. So design it for what event you want to do the most. Um, if you can hire a contractor or unless you or your um, somebody you know is an experienced heavy equipment operator to install, that's usually going to give you a better surface in the long run. Um, there may not be a whole lot of arena design companies up here in North Dakota, but there are across the nation that are willing to travel if you're really looking and in investing in someone um, to help you build this. The other option is a lot of people that um, are building roadways it's kind of similar to building an arena. You have the, the sub base, you have the base, and then, you know, instead of paving or putting gravel down on top, we have our surface that is suitable for riding. So that's another um, area of expertise that can be converted to building, helping you build an arena. The best option, of course, would be to get somebody that is extremely knowledgeable in the area and have them help you design it. And then if you can put a liner down, it's going to certainly last a lot longer as well, those fabric geotextile liners. All right, so we talked a little bit about this intended primary use considerations for general riding. Oftentimes you can get by with a little bit um, 
less design, especially if it's temporary. So our general writing, we typically want about two inches of that surface material. Speed events are going to need it to be quite a bit deeper along with a different base. And whereas our rain and cutting, um, you're gonna need to have a, also a different surface and base. So keep that in mind. And we can certainly, we don't, well, we don't have time today to go into specifics for each of the events. We're gonna talk just about general riding arenas particularly. The other thing I just want to throw out there right now is there are a couple of different considerations for indoor versus outdoor facilities. So we're going to primarily talk about outdoor. However, keep in mind that if you're designing an indoor facility, typically it's smaller square footage. So sometimes people are willing to invest a little bit more in that because in North Dakota, maybe they're going to use their indoor facility more than their outdoor facility, especially in uh, winters like we had recently. Um, it's also easier to justify dust control products inside because they're not going to wash away or leach away like they would in an outdoor space. And the synthetic materials, the same. They're not going to blow away, uh, wash away, or um, kind of disintegrate as quickly in an indoor facility as they would in an outdoor. Our outdoor arenas typically are larger, maybe because we have more space. We're not worried about um, the cost of putting walls and a roof over our indoor. So often they are built to be larger. The outdoor and the indoor should be graded as well with the building, but the outdoor, it's really essential that it's graded for drainage. If we don't grade it, what happens over time is that as we work that soil, it becomes a bowl. It becomes a holding area for rainwater and snow melt runoff to pool and sit. So the drying process occurs much less slowly and you'll get less use out of it. So grading your arena is essential at a 2% slope is recommended, 1% to 2%. The other thing the outdoor has is, is those weather impacts that we mentioned before. So wind, sun, the rain, snow, you're going to end up with some weeds over time to, if, you're, if you're not maintaining it or using it as much, and then dust. So we will visit about some of those considerations as well. This image is from one of our resources that we referenced to in the and it's from Iowa State University, and it gives you just a, a visual of that slope that you'd want to design on an outdoor arena. So there's different ways to do it. Most commonly, we have um, the cross section of the slope where the 2% slope begins at the top um, of the arena, and it narrows all the way over to the bottom of the arena in one direction. Direction. And you can crown them as well in the center, but those crowns over time, if not drug properly, will, will wear down and you'll end up with a, a flat surface. So typically grading from one side of the arena across the long end all the way to the other side, like shown in the cross section um, B over on the right hand side is the most common in this area. It is recommended to grade before fencing. It's much easier to do. And, and outdoor arenas don't need to have fences around them. That's a personal preference if you want it for safety or maybe you're doing an event um, that you need to like cow horse or cutting where you need to keep those livestock in, then you need a fence. But not all arenas have um, fences around them. It's recommended that you make the pad of your arena, that base of your arena, at least 10 feet wider than the arena needs to be. And that will help keep the footing from uh, kind of expanding out of the area that you want to ride in. That's a good recommendation to keep in mind. Make it bigger than you think it needs to be. Okay, so let's talk a little bit from the ground up. So the first step that we'd recommend is that you remove your topsoil. Uh, that topsoil getting mixed into the footing causes some challenges that we'll talk about, um, but removing that is the best recommendation. Placing your footing on top of your topsoil is not as ideal. It can be done, and if, if that's where you're at, that it is acceptable, it's just not ideal, and we're going to try to talk about an ideal situation. Then you'd want to go down to the, the sub base and that's going to be whatever your native soil, your clay is underneath there and compact that and slope that at that 2%, 1 to 2%. I recommend 2%. Um, most horses and riders aren't going to really feel or see a 2% grade, but that water will drain much more quickly. 
And then the, the fabric liner is optional. This will add considerable expense and also require some expertise in installation. But what that does is it prevents the native soil from mixing with whatever footing you choose to bring in. And it also keeps the rocks from migrating up into your footing through the freeze thaw process that we deal with quite a bit up north. Um, that's a real thing to have those rocks from the sub base moving up into your desirable footing over time. That liner helps with that. It also helps drain and dry your footing quickly after a rain event. Then you have the base. The base is going to be compacted well draining material and some people use clay for this but if you can use a, a road base material or some people call it stone dust, limestone dust, um, that's going to pack down really nicely and be the best draining material. If you that's not in the budget or you don't have the option, some will also use a, a clay. This base is going to be four to six inches deep sitting on top of that sub base um, or even on that fabric if you have that option. And then lastly, this is what most people think of when they build arenas is just the footing. And that's the two to four inches, depending upon your, your use of the arena that's on top. And that's what people see and that's what they think about, but there's so much more to it. We need that base, we need that sub base, and we wanted it installed correctly so that it, it serves us the way that we are hoping and lasts long as well. As far as the material goes, we're gonna talk about these next. So we have the native soil option that that might be the best option for you in your situation. However, the better option and probably the most common we see in North Dakota is bringing in a sand product and blending that potentially with that native soil. There's also some recommendations out there about using wood products, which isn't as common in North Dakota because we just don't have that byproduct readily available. So it actually adds an expense. Um, recycled rubber shavings or ground up rubber is an option, uh, synthetic fibers and road base mixes. So we will discuss each of those individually. So the first one is the native soil. So some choose to start with their native soil and riding it and choose to maybe add a more ideal footing to it over time as their budget allows, as their schedule allows, as they develop their property. So if that works for you, this is certainly an option. That native soil is going to be a mixture of clay, silt, sand, and organic matter. It's going to compact. The downsides is that it is dusty and gets hard when it's dry. And then unfortunately, it's pretty slippery when it's wet and it dries very slowly because that organic matter holds a lot of moisture in it. So native soil arenas tend to work best if the soil is amended at at least 50% um, with another material, typically sand. Sand arenas are the most common and, and seems like the go-to option for the variety of disciplines. You ideally would want to bring in sand that has been screened for rocks. This will save you many, many hours of rock picking or many hours of labor having to do so. And then also investing in a sand that has been washed, so both screened and washed, will help reduce the fines and the dust particles in those sands to give you a more uh, pure product. The next point on here is very important as well, is when you're purchasing your sand, you want angular sand or quote unquote sharp sand. If those sand molecules are really round, which is common in river type sand, sands that have been weathered by water moving through them over many, many years, those are more slippery and provide less traction. So we prefer our angular sands. Typically those are coming out of um, uh, gravel quarries in North Dakota. You can mix uh, five to 30% and you know, the lower recommendations is what I'd start with a lower percentage of clay or organic material blended into your sand to add stability. In the next slide, I'll show you why that is. The other thing is to start with the least amount and continue adding it slowly. So say, you know, you just bring in all these truckloads of sand and all of a sudden you end up with eight inches of sand on top of your footing. It's going to be really hard on your horse and it increase their risk of soft tissue injuries just because the, it's too deep, it's too loose. So the recommendation is to start with a two inch layer across your riding surface and then add additional uh, footing one inch at a time. Most general riding purposes will be okay with two inches but I'd recommend going at least a three to four. That way you have a little bit extra time before you need to add more sand into the future. Most of our events are going to want four inches as well. It's kind of a, just a good number to go by. 
So this kind of homemade picture is trying to help explain why those round river sands on the less on the left aren't as ideal. They all have a similar shape. There's a lot of pore surface. The water does drain quickly through these sands and dry quickly for you to ride in, but these sands are extremely slippery. So they don't provide the traction for quick maneuvers, sharp turns. So whether you're barrel racing, um, the footing just comes out underneath of the horse and, and they don't provide the traction that we need. What is better is to have those angular sands as well mixed in with that five to 30 percent of a clay or uh, loam material because they have various shapes and sizes to those soil particles. So they're able to kind of glue or meld together better. Um, they're more stable under your horse's foot. So think about um, like if you're walking on the beach, um, that really deep sand that gets dry is harder to walk in and, and you really kind of feel that in your, your muscles when you're walking through versus the ones that are more wet, um, closer to the, the shoreline. Um, and that goes into watering, which we'll discuss in a little bit as well. But again, those various shapes and sizes of our sand mixed together with that clay and organic material is going to be more stable. It'll also hold on to water a little bit longer. So we don't want water to pool on top of our arena. That would be our, our heavily clay footings that do that. But we do want some water to stay in the surface because moisture provides that traction. So that goes back to the comparison of the really dry beach sand that's deep and doesn't provide traction versus some closer to the shoreline that has moisture in it, much easier to maneuver on. There's also a lot of additives out there. And these we're going to touch on briefly. There may be, there's certainly options to haul in. There's pros and cons to them. And sometimes just availability and getting it done is an issue, particularly in North Dakota. So one of the options is wood products. So mixing in um, sawdust or shavings that provides an organic material that will hold on to that water a little bit longer and provide more cushion and a little bit more stability. However, if you get too much of that, it can do the opposite and cause more slippage. The downside of this is that it does break down quickly and that turns into a dust product. So anytime you have organic uh, material in your footing, you're going to have more dust when it's dry. You also risk, if it's not clean shavings, um, you risk having debris in there. So say you're getting some you know, ground wood pallets or something, there could be staples and nails, no matter how many magnets they run through them, there's some of those risks of having contamination in that product. The other thing that some people inquire about is rubber. The big thing on using rubber is that you want to make sure that it's guaranteed to come from a wire-free facility. So ground uh, car tires would not be recommended. They have all of those very fine wires that would cause damage and injury to your, to your horses. Um, so not recommended there. But there are things, uh, clean rubber, recycled rubber, that is an option. Um, they will separate out of the footing quite readily, so it does require frequent incorporation, and they do float to the surface with excess moisture as well. Lastly, or not lastly, but the next one on the list is stall waste. So you will hear some people say, well, I just put some of the dirty shavings to uh, hold a little bit of moisture in my arena. We don't recommend this. Well, while it is an option and, and it, some people do choose to use this, we don't recommend this because it gets very slippery when it's wet. It does attract flies when it's wet particularly. So there'll be much, much more um, organic material there for the flies to lay eggs in and feed on. And then it gets really dusty when it's dry and you're lofting that that um, dust into the air for both you and your horse to breathe. Synthetic fibers are something uh, that is option on the market as well. Typically these are more common indoors because they are a little bit more expensive so you don't want them blowing away in the wind or washing away in a rainstorm. They add cushion and they hold moisture and they blend in typically with your your sand to provide a little bit more cushion and the, the dust reduction. Um, Depending upon your budget, they may work for you, they may not. They're very common in um, a lot of the, the English events, particularly, really use a lot of the synthetic fibers in their arena surfaces. 
And then the last one would be road base or stone dust. So these are very common in some areas that have access to uh, excess of this material. It does compact very quickly and very firmly. There's a reason why it's used in, in road base settings. So I would prefer that this be used in your base material rather than your top uh, surface material because it does need to be worked very regularly. It gets dusty pretty easily when it's wet, it really compacts down. So it is best suited for a base. Let's talk briefly about dust management, indoors versus outdoors. So outdoors, a lot of times it's a little bit more economical because it lasts longer. And um, outdoors, sometimes we rely on mother nature to provide a little bit of dust control. And if you're trying to do dust control outdoors, it could leach and then it dries out really quickly in the, the sun and the wind. So you can add a lot of water to an outdoor arena and it's almost a daily event on hot sunny days. But the idea behind dust management that we really want to reduce the fine particles that are being kicked up and lofted into the air. So we can do this through watering and it is a good idea to keep your arena watered to a depth of three inches in the top surface. The other additive that you can use is, is a variety of salts. So most recommended is going to be magnesium chloride salts and calcium chloride salts. You can use a straight up uh, sodium chloride, but that has one less ion to bind on, so it doesn't quite last as long. It doesn't quite absorb as much moisture. So magnesium chloride and calcium chloride are the most common. Um, you can get these in bulk. You can get them shipped in, in small bags, depending upon the size of your arena. The recommendation is 20 to 50 pounds per thousand square foot. Oftentimes in, in North Dakota, people like to do this right before winter too, because these salts help the prevent the footing from freezing and be so then you're able to use your footing all season long, as long as the weather allows. There are some oils that you can add out there. They're not readily available. You really have to search for them, but some different byproduct oils that again coat the surf up. There's also uh, commercial polymers out there and waxes up out there that do the similar thing. They're not as readily available nor as cost effective. So primarily we see salts being used for dust management. So watering is very important. Whether you have an indoor or an outdoor, watering is good. So it helps maintain the stability of your footing. Again, the dry, really dry footing is going to be less stable. On the flip side, Side, we don't want it too wet because that causes issues as well. So we want to keep it evenly moist to a depth of three, in three inches. You know, if you think about like just watering your lawn, if you just go out there and kind of hand sprinkle it, it doesn't do a lot of good. It evaporates really quickly. It doesn't last. Um, you also don't want to flood it to where it's, it's setting. So a even moisture to three inches is recommended. Probably going to be much less than the winter because if you overwater in the winter, you're going to risk leaching those salts out, washing those salts away, and then you're going to have a frozen footing that's unusable. When you're designing an arena space, consider installing a hydrant near the arena or placing it somewhere where you can easily get water to it. Or maybe you're going to do a, a tractor or a truck mounted uh, watering setup. That's, that's another option. So hand watering, while it takes a lot of Time might be the only option for some people. That's just getting out there with the hose and, and watering the arena. Um, using sprinklers is okay, but a lot of times we end up with a really wet area right underneath where that sprinkler was. And then 30, 40 feet out at the end of the stream, it's, it's not as much. There's also self-traveling irrigation systems that you can look into and purchase if you want to cut down on the time and get a little bit more evenly watered. And then tractor or drag mounted watering systems as well. So a lot of times it's just use what works for you, what fits into your, your method, your budget, and your schedule. So the one of the last things we're going to talk about is maintenance. So again, you can build that best arena, but if it's not in the right spot, it's not going to be the best arena. And then you can build the best arena in the world, but if you don't maintain the surface regularly or properly, um, it will degrade much quicker and not be as used. The frequency of surface maintenance is dependent on how much you use it. If you're a single um, horse owner that's just out there with a couple of horses a day, um, you might not need to work it all the time. Uh, if you're out there with managing an event where there's hundreds of horses running around that surface, you might need to be working it every couple hours or every so many um, events, however you set up your schedule. The high traffic areas are going to need the most attention. So these are along the rail typically within 10 feet of the rail, the center line, 
the diagonals across the arena and areas where uh, a specific event is occurring occurring like around barrels or poles for speed events or if you're roping when they you know straight out from the roping shoot you're going to need those high traffic areas to be maintained more closely and more frequently than some of the other areas the other recommendation is to minimize that debris contamination so um, maybe it's not going to be practical in an outdoor arena to pick every manure pile that occurs and some of it's going to get worked into the sand or the footing over time and that's okay it does provide some of that um, it, some benefits a little bit, but you don't want to get it overdone. So say you have an indoor arena and it's winter time and you kicked your horses out there to, to exercise or to get away from the shelter. You want to remove that manure. You don't want to have a lot of manure getting put into that uh, footing over time. Okay, So within reason, try to keep the manure out of the arena. Same thing for hay. I mean, try not to feed your horses hay or bed on the arena surface. That's very difficult to get out. Um, can kind of plug up your drags and, and equipment as well. Manage your weeds and weed management in arenas that are being used is pretty minimal because um, you're working it regularly. There, weeds just aren't going to have a chance to establish. But if you aren't working it regularly um, or don't have the equipment to do so, um, you might want to consider some other methods of control, maybe spraying them um, or just keeping in mind like when those weeds start to germinate and pop up, go and take care of them. Uh, but most people, if they're working it regularly, the weeds are kept at bay. You might have problems around the edges of the arena, though. And then um, wood chips. So a lot of times people, again, will um, want to add some of the either contaminated bedding or they'll want to add wood into the, the footing, which is sometimes acceptable. Try to go with the sawdust and minimize any large pieces of wood or any of the debris that could come with, you know, ground pallets and that sort of a wood byproduct. The other thing to keep in mind for wood is that there are some uh, trees that are toxic to horses. So think of our black walnuts and our cherry trees that can cause um, foundering and laminitis in our horses. So we want to avoid those materials as well. I'm not going to go in depth on implement selection because this is highly uh, variable depending upon your budget. What sort of uh, towing vehicle? Do you just have an ATV? Are you using a pickup? Do you have what horsepower is your tractor? So it's highly variable. It's highly variable on price point too. But I do want to highlight that you can have a very simple option where it can just be a hair on a drag if you have a light surface that's only a couple inches deep for light riding. That is an, an acceptable and affordable way to maintain your surface is getting a harrow um, and, and using whatever means you have to pull that harrow around. The more advanced methods are going to be pretty specific. So if you look for arena maintenance equipment out there, there's a lot of different opinions. There's plenty of companies that are selling different types of implements anywhere from a couple thousand dollars up to six figures or more by the time you have the implement and a towing tractor um, involved in that. The advanced ones have some pretty cool features, though. They'll have something that will uh, level your base as you are working your arena. So we'll keep that base level and compacted nicely and just dig into the surface footing and fluff that up. They can contain watering systems and you can adjust that to add just the right amount of water to keep your footing stable and keep it from blowing away and provide that extra cushion and traction for your horse. Some of them contain laser levels so that you can maintain that grade in your arena more accurately. And then depth settings as well. So if you want to work, you know, you know that you have four inches of or five inches of topsoil or not topsoil, your surface on top of your base and you want to work it down to four and a half, you can really work that depth setting or you want it at three inches depending upon what event you're prepping for. So it can get really, really advanced and really cool stuff, or it can be as simple as a, a simple harrow that um, Mary showed for dragging manure piles too. A lot of different options depending upon what your um, fits your situation the best. I'm going to touch briefly on arena drag patterns, though, because this is something that um, I think a lot of people can benefit from. So consistent speed is important. If you're going fast and you're going slow, you're going to put waves in your arena or kind of like undulations in your arena surface. So when you're shifting gears on your four wheeler or your tractor, that can cause some issues. So keep a consistent speed the entire time that you're working the arena. The standard drag pattern for an arena is to drag parallel with the long end. So you're going to come in on either of the short ends of the arena and go straight and keep it parallel with the long end of the arena. 
that's the most standard pattern. Um, switching which direction you turn uh, each time you drag. So a standard pattern and then kind of reverse it and go the other way. Do not drag across the center in a crowned outdoor arena because you will lose that grade and you'll lose the, you know, if you're sloping two degrees, kind of like think of it as a peak and you're sloping out to the edges, if you come across the center and drag it the short way or perpendicular to the long wall, you will um, eliminate that grade pretty quickly. So keep with the grade by dragging parallel to the long edge of the arena. Another method that will help smooth out ridges and those undulations, maybe you got a new tractor and you're struggling with shifting it and you got all sorts of ridges in there, is kind of the spinning method. So that's taking um, your surface drag in there and driving in small circles and spiraling your way up the arena and then spiraling your way back down again. And that's going to help smooth out the surface and remove some of those undulations. There are also some really good um, YouTube videos. So to get a visual of that, um, go on YouTube and search for, you know, arena drag patterns. If you're struggling with getting your arena leveled out, that'll give you a visual of that as well. I do want to point you out to a couple of the resources that Extension has. So the first one is the Horse Facilities Handbook. This is a for purchase publication. They have more than just arena footing in this book, though. So if you're building a facility, it's definitely um, worthwhile to, to look into that purchasing that particular handbook. And then the other one is, is uh, Penn State. They have a lot of information about arena footing and there's a lot of information through um, the horse.com. They have a lot of great research that's been published. Um, that's kind of interesting. Uh, again, maybe not as accessible here in North Dakota as far as materials and supplies and practicality goes, but it's out there and, and there are being some, uh, they're finding some new things about um, arena footing. So if you have a horse that maybe you're struggling with keeping sound or you just want to do the best by them and this is of interest to you, uh, reach out to me and I can send you some of that research. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary and she's going to uh, summarize the day. Okay, so um, up on the screen, you should see your poll. It's our last poll. Um, and so just a usefulness rating of our webinar today. Thank you so much to Rachel and Paige for joining, not only as my co-host for this uh, entire series, but also for presenting for the last two uh, that we've done. And so um, just looking at everything that Rachel and Paige talked to us about today, maintenance. Um, I, we, I don't do, I have a pony. And we do little um, two and a half year old riding around on the back right now and brushing the pony. And so none of, of these things we do as far as um, maintenance of an arena. But man, it's a lot. Like You guys put a lot of effort into maintaining those arenas. And so um, really good information here. So Paige, there were two questions that I think you could answer. One of them you did answer, but I just wanted you to summarize again. Um, and so the first sure. one is, what are options for keeping the ground from freezing? Are there any safe products? Yeah, those those salts are the most common and, and easy to use. There is a concern by some that they can be um, corrosive or damaging to the horse hooves. Um, so some people will choose to rinse off the horse every time they use that footing. That probably isn't going to be practical in the winter in North Dakota um, or wipe down any of that that salted sand that could be on their legs. Um, other, I guess we haven't found any real solid research that it does any long term damage. But if you have a horse that might be sensitive to that, that might be something you consider. But those salts, uh, magnesium chloride and calcium chloride are the, the best options for this area. Okay. Um, another question is, what would you recommend for an arena that has a rock hard base, no sub base, and only two inches of river sand on the top? It's a, an indoor that we are trying to save. Uh, so we consider textiles, but not sure what else we should be looking at. Sure. Yeah. So that's, that has a lot of options to it and it would depend on your primary use. So if you're, if you're primarily using that arena for general riding, I would say adding more surface material would be an option. I would ask more questions about what that current surface material is like. Is that sand worn out? And maybe I didn't touch on this enough that 
footing doesn't last forever. So this, um, it depends on how much you use it. But over time, the, even that sand, you don't think a sand is breaking down. It's, it's an inorganic compound, but it does. It breaks down into smaller pieces. It can get dustier over time with more use. So sometimes the best option, depends on your situation, is stripping out all of that two inches or whatever you have in your arena and replacing it with a more desirable new fresh footing particularly if you're struggling with dust issues. If you're not, you can add to that two inches um, with a, a type of material. So I'd need to ask more questions on exactly what you have. I'd wanna see it, I'd, I'd wanna know a little bit more before I give specifics on that, but it's, it's salvageable. And oftentimes it comes down to how much you wanna invest in it as well. Okay, very good. Uh, we had another question come in here. And so, uh we have dust issues for sure yes so how does one mitigate all the gopher holes and mounds in an outdoor arena oh sure so if you can reduce or eliminate the gophers that are causing the issues that would be the number one solution um, and then i would be curious to know if that outdoor arena was uh, just the native soil or if it has a base to it. Um, typically gophers aren't going to work down into your compacted limestone base um, or even into a, a heavy clay base, but they can and they do, especially the persistent ones. So it would, you know, kind of depend on how bad the situation is, whether you would need to kind of start over or just work those gopher mounds up and get them to relocate or um, choose a gopher poison. Um, there's a lot of different options just depending upon what route you want to take. But I would recommend um, getting those gophers to relocate. Okay, very good. And this is a new farm, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you could try just uh, continuous tillage and see if they choose to go elsewhere. Otherwise, you might want to consider some lethal control methods. Okay. So with that, I think we will uh, end for the day unless there are any further questions. Uh, and just know that you can always send us an email uh, and we will answer those questions too if anything comes up after this is over. So with that, I want to thank Rachel and Paige for joining me as co-hosts of this series. And like I said, uh, feel free to send us any suggestions for future webinars. Thank you. Mm -hmm.